Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. Mm. Welcome everyone. This is Brie Noble. I'm so excited to be with you today and with my guest, Mike Myers from Songwriting for Guitar. And I was just commenting to him that I love his brand name because it's very, very clear what he does which, you know, sometimes we get all excited about these clever brand names and then like people are like, but I don't understand, what do you do? So obviously we're gonna be talking today about songwriting for guitar, Um, but first I wanna get into his story. How did he, you know, well, what is his musician story first of all? And then how did he get into teaching guitar and like all the, um, the ways that he, teaches guitar and songwriting and how that like morphed into what he's doing today. So we'd love to hear all of that from you, Mike, first, before we get into um, some other questions. Well, Bree, thank you for having me. I'm super pumped. Yeah, when I created it, I did want it to be pretty simple (laughs) and not clever, because I think I used to do that a lot in songwriting titles. I tried to be too clever where it was just like, what does this mean? I have no idea what this is about. Oh, that reminds me of like in the 90s, you know, when Alternative was popular and it was like the song title would be like one word that like you could never find in the song. And so you'd never remember the name of the song because it didn't make any sense, right? It made no sense. I totally get that. And then later on in the 2000s, then you went to like long sentences as the title and then there were brackets. Parentheses. Yeah, with the the little brackets. And it's just like, oh, now it's gone to the other extreme. We swung the other way to the pendulum. So yeah, I tried to keep clarity on that. But um, my music story, I mean, music has been basically my entire life. You know, I grew up, you know, as an only child, I was not an athletic child. (laughs) Athleticism was not something that I found really appealing. I went to Catholic school and I had a couple options. It was basketball, 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 or basketball. (laughs) None of them. Or being considered a total nerd, right? Because you don't play basketball. Yeah, I didn't, you know, it was, it was the extreme. It was like, I didn't like that. Um, But I did like Mr. Rogers and Mr. Rogers played piano. And it was just like, I saw that it was nice because I was surrounded in one area of school that was giving me one narrative. And then he was giving me, oh, here's music. And here's like a form of self-expression. And I found that really, I, for once I was like, I think I could do that. And so I begged my parents, please, can I play piano? Can I play piano? And they were like, wait a year because, you know, kids, sometimes they want to do this one thing, but then, you know, 10 seconds later, I want to be a ninja. Let me be a ninja. Train me to be a ninja. That's exactly what I did when my daughter said she wanted to play the drums when she was five. I'm like, wait a year and see if you still want to do it. Or or no, I think I said, take a year of piano. And then if you still want to take drums, you can. And then like she grew out of that. She wanted to continue with piano. (laughs) So that was really smart of your parents. And that's what happened. I waited and it was the same thing. I just kept on being like, when is it going to happen? Is it time yet? Is it time yet? And they were like, okay, you're serious about it. So I ended up doing it. Uh, And I loved it because no one else was doing music. So it kind of gave me an identity. While everybody was doing this one thing, I was doing something that was like unique and it really spoke to me. And I had a teacher that was not bad, but I could tell like he was also, he was doing it for the money. Like, (laughs) and that was, you know, because he was a teacher and it was like, okay, cool. So every lesson was the same. I had to hand the check first for $15, $15, because that was like the exchange money. And it was like, now as an adult, I was like, oh, I didn't realize how that made an impression on me. Mm -hmm. Like, it was just like, I could tell he was doing it for the money, but I didn't care because I was like, I wanted to understand this. Did this for a long time, fast forward to maybe high school. And I was like, I need to learn the guitar. My parents got me a guitar 
And I was like, all right, this is hard. And it sat in my closet for like three and it hurt. years. Yeah. That's what I was like. I really want to learn this, but I don't know. It hurts. And then I'm afraid I won't be able to play the piano because then I have these like big indentations in my fingers and I can't feel the keys. It was. And it was just, I was just like, nope, not going to do it. And so I just did this period where I just didn't, it just sat in my closet. But I suddenly really got into punk and I saw all these friends that were in bands. They were setting up bands. They were, you know, writing songs. And I was like, well, I don't think I can do this with piano. <laughs> I think I can do this with guitar. So that's what I have to do. And so my, you know, before my senior year, I pulled out the guitar, dusted it off, started to go through, you know, things I could find on dial up internet, which took forever because it was still like 2002 and things were really slow still. And it was just that age of dial up. And I finally took lessons and it was an extreme opposite. I found a teacher that was willing, that really enjoyed the instrument, but was willing to teach it to me in a way that was right for me and not just this blanket, like, this is what you do. He gave me a book, but then he could tell I could care less about the book. And he was like, okay, I want you to bring in a CD next week. And so I just started every week. It was a new CD. It was a different song. And out of those songs, he was able to teach me concepts and things that were super important fundamentally, but in context to something that I could relate it back to, which at the time I was just like, cool, I'm learning a song. But now as a teacher, I'm like, that was amazing because it was not just like, oh, here's the concept. It's like, here's the concept and here's something you can relate it back to. And so did bands, did bands, did bands, did bands, and then eventually did one band that was did pretty well. Like we were able to tour a lot. We broke even a lot of the time. That's pretty dang so good. That, well, was, well, that was a win. Um, we were able to do some some good tours. We were able to play things like Warp Tour and with other bands that were kind of in that pop punk genre that we were able to open for and it did well. But then eventually it kind of lost its momentum. Mm -hmm. And I was teaching, I eventually found myself teaching because prior to teaching i was working at a car wash because who wants to take someone's job at a car wash when they leave to go on tour it's not appealing nobody goes oh i really want to be around chemicals and have customers yell at me no nobody does and so that's why that job was always secure and somebody uh that came to our shows was like my teacher's looking for uh, another person would you be interested and i was like no because i i mean I don't know anything about teaching. And then I thought about it and I was like, well, it's better than a car wash. So I agreed. I thought it was just going to be like a, maybe a job that I'm at for maybe a year or two, and then I'll move on to something else. I ended up loving it. I found myself kind of really immersing myself into understanding my instrument more because it's one thing when it was me just playing, but to explain it and break down the fundamentals to someone that's brand new, I had a newfound appreciation for all the things I was taking for granted that I was just kind of doing out of the motions. But more importantly, I didn't realize the next four years was going to give me an education in modern songwriting and top songs because the ages that I was teaching, you know, in that teenager range and also early 20s, they wanted to learn a lot of top songs, things that I wasn't listening to because I was in my little bubble. I was in my punk bubble and I was like, no, 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 it's not good. Not good. You know, I'm going to stay true to my genre. But when you're a teacher, I'm not going to tell someone no, because my teacher at guitar was very accepting of my genre, even though he was a metalhead. He saw things and saw my appreciation for the genre. And he was willing if that kept my interest going and I was willing to dig in because of this song then he was willing to teach it. So I just kept that mentality. But what was wonderful is I was seeing all these top 40 songs. I was teaching them over and over because at maybe my, you know, the longest, you know, I was maybe teaching six days a week, maybe eight hours, six to eight hours a day. So it was Ooh, like for four years. And it was just like, that was my school and I didn't realize it, but I was listening to these songs. I was breaking them down. I was really starting to uh, grow musically because suddenly I was being stretched. And as I was teaching, I was starting to take lessons from other folks. So I was going around and just, you know, from other teachers that were a little bit more advanced, going over here and getting more and more, building my arsenal so that I was 
fully equipped and still helping my students that as they were learning, I was learning too, that I was I think not. That's so it. important that, you know, a lot of teachers don't do that. Probably your piano teacher that was taking your $15. He wasn't out there, <laughs> you know, taking his own lessons and, and making sure that he was improving. He was just teaching in the exact same way over and over again. And you, not only did you want to understand your students and what, how they learn and all that stuff, but you wanted to keep bettering yourself so you could stay ahead of them which I really appreciate in a teacher. I did want to mention, I think, yeah, I love the idea um, of how you were kind of learning about songs and song structure and songwriting because you had to break down those songs to teach it to your students, right? It, it's fascinating because it's just like the things that maybe a couple of years ago prior to teaching, I would have written off as like, oh, that's radio stuff. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, I was breaking it down and listening to production because when I challenged myself every time I had to listen to a song, because some songs I may be listening to, you know, be teaching that same song 20 other times that week. But within that one lesson, I may be listening to that song six, seven, eight times because we're going over certain sections. I would challenge myself to listen to it in a different way. Like, okay, I'm used to listening to the guitar part. I'm going to listen to the melody because sometimes I would even teach the melody on guitar to bring it back to scales and like different styles. I would listen to the production that's happening and I'd be like, oh my goodness. Like, it's like really sparse. Like, holy crap. Like that they're only using four notes in that melody the entire time. They just jumped to the, it was just like, I was seeing everything. I was starting to see patterns. And to me, that's what made it intriguing. And suddenly I found a new appreciation because here, it, here I was, I looked at all the songs that I used to write in bands and I realized, oh, that's why maybe things didn't always hit the mark mm -hmm. because it was, I suddenly saw through this new lens, things that were chaotic all over the place. We were too busy. We we're trying to be almost like the, you know, a title. We were trying to be too clever. Mm. And nobody goes to a show and goes like, God, I love watching that clever band. That's why I bought this ticket because they're so clever. No, it's just because it's catchy. It's good. It draws them in. You know, I find people that go like, oh, that's clever. They're not the ones buying the tickets or the merch. They just have an appreciation for clever. The ones that are there, buying the merch, buying the tickets, buying the songs, downloading it because they find it hooky and catchy and they sing along to it. It's relatable. So when I made maybe four or five years into teaching, I was like, I want to be a songwriter because it was still eating at me. It was still, it didn't go away. It maybe subsided for a little bit, but it just like, it came back and I was like, well, what do I want to do? And I was like, well, I think I want to do commercial songwriting and like more sync licensing and get my songs in television and, 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 you know, film because, you know, there's so many shows out there. There has to be a way. So I took classes. I, I studied up and I just started, you know, I crossed a new bridge too. And just the idea of like investing in myself, that was something I didn't really do. And that was a whole new thing I had to get used to that. I wasn't spending money on a class. I was investing because the end result was going to give me new information that I could utilize and go to the next step. So every time that I started to do that, I got more and more comfortable about investing in myself. And then I started to do more songwriting. I was writing all the time. I was writing with new people. And then eventually my, my clientele were all songwriters. I was teaching songwriters. I was teaching co-writers. And I realized I was teaching the same formula where they would be like, well, how do you do this thing when we're writing a song and you say it's this, this, and this? And I'm like, oh, well, that's because it's this, this, and this, because I know in this genre, you have to listen for, and then I realized, oh, wait a minute. What I have now taken for granted because I gave myself like this seven year schooling on basically a ton of listening and breaking down songs. What I think is widely known is suddenly not widely known. I have, almost developed a little system of here are the three things you need to listen for. Here's what we need to work on. And this is what's going to give you kind of that formula for the genre that you want to try to write for. Because when you're writing for an artist, that's important because they have a style, they have a voice. You need to make sure you're, you're listening for that. When you're trying to write for sync, you're given a brief where they say, if they say Kings of Leon, even if you nail the most perfect Fleetwood Mac, that's not Kings of Leon. That's that's Fleetwood Mac. That's great. If there's a brief that looks for that, awesome. But if you're trying to aim for this, then you're going to miss the mark. And then I realized after a while, 
people would, when I'd go to, you know, Nashville or LA, sometimes I'd get coffee with people and they'd be like, can I buy you a cup of coffee? After a while, as much as I love it, the coffee consumption was getting way too high because I was saying the same things over and over and over. And I thought maybe I had a few friends that were doing online classes and they were like, you should, you know, think about doing that. And much like when somebody suggested you should teach, I was like, I don't know. I don't know if people would. And then I realized, no, I, I, I think this is something people need to know. And that's why I created songwriting for guitar, because my goal is to empower songwriters with their guitar skills. They should be controlling the guitar and most allow their guitar to control how the song turns out or when they're performing, they kind of, it's almost, they're like, well, the guitar is in charge. And that's a terrible, <laughs> that's a terrible thing because then the guitar is going to take you on this roller coaster ride. It's almost like when you go to an open mic and you hear that one guitarist that just strums, 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 strums. And no matter how well-crafted the lyric is and how beautiful the melody is, if you're given this one blanket line of just like loud strumming, it's, it's, it doesn't matter how good the melody or the lyric is. No one's listening because they're just, just distracting. They're tuning out the white noise of just that one strumming that you've got going. Yeah. Oh, I love this. And, <laughs> and I, I love your evolution. It's so similar to a lot of people that I know that now, you know, have online courses. It's like they discovered that they were super good at something that they didn't even know that they were going to be good at, you know, and then they were super really passionate about it. And then again, like they, would get asked to help individuals and, you know, it moves into groups and then it's like, Hey, I can have an online course. So let's talk about, um, as far as like what you teach in your online course, I know that there are kind of some traps that guitar playing songwriters get into. And like you were saying a minute ago about just the strum, 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 and like never changing the pattern and all that. Like, what are some of the common things that like habits that people get into just because they don't don't realize that there's another way or that you know how they can change things up to make it more interesting yeah, the number one thing is and i've realized this through teaching a wide variety of age ranges but just some of the most common similarities between kind of the the pitfalls the first thing whatever genre or whatever decade you grew up in especially when you're a teenager that ends up being your strumming pattern for life. That's mm. your default strumming pattern because there's something about that age. And I, and I fell into this because during that period when you're a teenager, I think it's, you're filled with hormones and emotions. And it's just like the songs speak to you. And you're like, this is the soundtrack of my generation. It's yes. just the generation. It just is absorbed that no matter what that comes out as your strumming pattern because a lot of people don't understand strumming patterns they just kind of if you if i stop someone and said what are you strumming they go i don't know or it's just like i kind of do this they can't really describe it and that's where the default comes in i remember this hit me vividly where i had a songwriter who was like mike i want to play you some songs and i was like go ahead played me three songs all identical strumming patterns. But what was interesting, immediately I was like, what does this remind me of? And I just closed my eyes and just listened to his intro. And I was like, oh. I was like, do you do you like the Goo Goo Dolls? And he was like, <laughs> you're my favorite band. And I was just like, oh, and it was just like, that was the flag for me that I was like, we don't realize it, but subconsciously it just always just comes out of us all the time, all the time. And if we're not aware of that, we won't break it we'll constantly write more and more songs. It doesn't matter how many songs we write. We're just given the same strumming pattern. The next big thing is we don't recognize dynamics when we're trying to convey the song. Uh, the, uh, the level at which we're strumming is just, if it's the same as our verse and our chorus, we're never taking the listener on that sort of like journey as it should be. It dynamics should build and drop, especially I find this crucial as a networking thing. When songwriters go to writer writers rounds, they play open mics. That is songwriting networking. Mm -hmm. And it's your calling card. Essentially, you could have the nicest card, the nicest website, but your songs are going to be your calling card. It's where you showcase what you're capable of writing. And even if you're a great lyricist, a great singer, if you're not 
building dynamics into your song. If you're not, especially, it doesn't matter how great the song is produced, when you're just using your guitar, that thing to communicate that song, if you're just keeping it at one level all the way through, it's not interesting. It's boring. That's when you notice people start talking more and more in the room. The room gets louder because everyone's talking. They don't care because they're just listening to this troning guitar. But I find the songwriters that can convey that dip in the verse and then suddenly like ramp it up slowly. And then suddenly we're, and it's like, oh, because the average listener doesn't understand song structure, but they understand loud and soft. And if they go like, oh, that's the that's the story part of the song. Your verses are here. Oh, that's the catchy part ramping up to the chorus. That makes it so clear. And again, stop trying to be clever. It keeps it very just like, oh, I understand. So we've got strumming, we've got dynamics. You know, I was gonna say is it's interesting yeah. about that as a pianist, right? I wonder if it's something about the guitar itself that it's easy to get into that auto mode um like you said of the not changing the dynamics i feel like on the piano that doesn't happen to me because i'm so like like one with the instrument when i'm playing it like i'm on top of the instrument i'm put, putting pressure i'm you know <laughs> and like I, I that does i feel like i get almost like way too dynamic -y when i play with the piano because i just become so into it um but i do i definitely have seen guitarists where they just like they get into that auto mode and they're like, like they're, they're singing and stuff is like a totally different thing than what their hands are doing. I think because they also try to wash their hands clean that they're a guitarist. Like they just say they're a songwriter. They say, I'm a melody person. I'm a lyricist. Uh... And then, like, that's great. But they just, and they take this guitar because I, when you take a piano around with you, you <laughs> have to own it. Like, you I noticed that I took that. It, you have my back like, letting it here. <laughs> I'm a piano. Like, it's just like, I'm using that as my form of communication. There's something when you just have a little guitar and you strap it on and you're just like, well, I just use it. I just write my songs. They downplay it so much that they need to own it. It's like, mm -hmm. listen, I don't accept that. It's like, if you are writing songs with your guitar, you're going out and playing songs with your guitar. You're carrying it around. You're a songwriting guitarist. You can't dismiss the two. It's not just one or the other. They're joined together. They're together. <laughs> and so that means if you're working on, I think of how much they spend on building their skills as a songwriter when it comes to melody and lyrics and buying books, they have no problem with that. But immediately when it comes to guitar, they write it off as it doesn't matter. But meanwhile, that is the most crucial element to the thing, because when I sit down to write a song, the next thing they don't pay attention to is voicings, because every genre has a different voicing, has a different way of communicating. Yes, GCD minor will never die. Those will always be chords that we love. I always like to think 2000 years from now, when I'm dead and gone, there's going to be a guy that picks up a guitar or a gal that picks up the guitar, plays GCD minor and goes, those are really good chords because they are. There's something about that, that pattern that just always feels good. But your goal as a songwriting guitarist is to find multiple ways to play that pattern because every genre has a different form of communication with GCD E minor. And if I pair myself with a pop artist, I'm not just going to clunk down on open chords because it's going to feel weird. And I find that certain voicings trigger certain melodies mm -hmm. and our brain, we like to think, Oh no, 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 no. Um, you know, uh, it doesn't matter. You know, voicings don't, they don't matter. They do because if we want to not fall into the same traps melodically, we have to create new things with our brain. We have to new, create new patterns with our brain and voicings unlock different melodies, melodies that we don't know that are in our brain. And that to me is always fascinating. So I think those are, those are a few things, uh, songwriters, especially ones that use their guitar, but haven't really delved into it are probably doing right now and they don't realize it, but the people that do realize it are their co-writers, are, are the people that are listening to their songs at writer's rounds. And sometimes they wonder why the same song turns out the same way, or maybe, you know, how come I didn't get asked back to that co-write? What was your role? And if you were the only one with a guitar and you were just hammering away or you weren't paying attention, that may be some of the reasons sometimes that, you know, things don't work out because there are some skills that just need to be built a little bit more. But once you do those, 
and you realize that those small little things, then your knowledge as a songwriter and your as a contributor in your co-writing, your value just like skyrockets tremendously. Mm, I mean, that's such a good point about the writer's rounds and it being like mm -hmm. almost an audition for like future collaborations, which can be like amazing for your career if these people have connections um, and you can develop relationships that will last over years, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but like, it's almost like when people don't think that they have to have a really good demo, they're like, the song will speak for itself, you know, <laughs> and, and it's like, it's the same thing, right? You have to really showcase the song in the best possible light. Mm -hmm. And that does involve the way you deliver it on the instrument. It's you, it, it's exactly that you hit the nail on the head where they're just like, oh, the song speaks for itself, does it? It's just like because I don't know, uh, it, because sometimes the best demos and the best work tapes that were delivered for a song were a simple guitar and vocal. Mm -hmm. I'm always blown away sometimes that you know they think, oh, the production's going to save it. Sometimes the production doesn't save it. A simple guitar that was tracked well to a metronome. If I were to sneak in another thing that I think is always huge, the metronome. So many dis, you know, don't practice with it, but man, if you can lock in with a metronome and you can suddenly be a person in a co-write that writes a killer song with someone and they go, hey, we got this guy really quick that can do a quick demo. Can you record that guitar? You wanna be able to be like, yes. You don't wanna be like, and then suddenly they spend an hour just being like, okay, so let's try that again with them. Because BPMs are crucial when it comes to songwriting, because you're talking about like, okay, what is the melody tempo that we're going to set to? Because some melodies need to be at a specific tempo. Otherwise, it's going to be too fast or too slow. I saw a friend and she fantastic songwriter. She has an amazing voice, great lyricist. She did an open mic and this was... Uh, when I was in Nashville and I came to one of her writer's rounds and it was, whew, she started off way too fast because I don't think she was thinking of the tempo. And so the melody was like, <laughs> and then she realized, but then she did what happened. She made it too slow because she was conscious of like, I started too fast, bringing it down. And then suddenly the melody got too slow. And then suddenly she found that where it needed to be. When you're practicing to a metronome prior before playing, I always do because I think about the BPMs of what, what my songs were written at or what I collaborated with, where we sat. I practice with that metronome because it's crucial to me to get that melody tempo right because melodically it had a particular phrasing that worked at a certain speed. If I'm not thinking of that with my guitar and suddenly I do start off too fast, brought it down too slow or the reverse, I start way too slow. And then suddenly the melody drags because it's, it's it, you want to have that confidence that when you step onto that stage, you sit down, you're like, I've practiced this. I've done the work. I know where it needs to sit tempo wise that that's important because there's a big difference between people that do that and those that just kind of like are on a wing and a prayer they kind of are at the mercy of their guitar mm, i love that these are all some really really actionable and great tips and i would love to know like so we've talked about the traps that people get into is there anything in going over kind of the things that people do wrong and what they can do better? Is there anything else that we haven't covered that are kind of in your, you know, main wheelhouse of what you are teaching songwriters on the guitar that we haven't covered yet? Oh, absolutely. Like, you know, th those are definitely the major pitfalls. And mm -hmm. I really work at songwriters, songwriting guitarists, trusting their ear. Think of how much music we've listened to in our lifetime. We walk around with so much self doubt and insecurity in our ability. If that's one thing sometimes I meet with folks, it's just that they're, the way they sometimes carry themselves or the way that they're, they're striving to be either this, uh, you know, unrealistic version of themselves or they're spending way too much time comparing themselves to others that they could instead understand their value of what they're bringing. They're bringing a unique perspective, their perspective. It's just as important. You know, I touched on, like I said, you know, when I played piano, uh, Mr. Rogers was huge. Well, think of what, how he ends his program. He goes, you know, there's only one person in the whole world like you, and that's you yourself. And people can like you exactly, exactly as you are. 
I find that still valuable as an adult. I still have to listen to that because if we, you know, we look at our phones daily, that's our job. We have to, you know, post things. We have to do things. We can fall through the trap of like, well, I'm looking at what so-and-so is doing. I'm looking at what so-and-so, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm lo and we've spent an hour looking at all these other good things. And we feel frankly like shit, we feel terrible about ourselves. My goal is to, yes, there are things that we can work on these pitfalls and there are things, actionable things, as you said, and I think that's important, the word actionable, not unrealistic, not, you know, you know, not light years away. These are actionable things that we can do to fix and get on track that will then highlight the things that we're great at, the things that we're good, the things that we bring to a right, the unique perspective, because my goal is to get songwriters, songwriting guitarists to use their listening ear to guide the right to know what to look for. If we can look for these few little things like voicings, better strumming patterns, techniques, understand all those little things that make a song unique that we're trying to aim for. Like if I was sitting down for a Jason Mraz song and I knew what to look for and I go, I need to understand this voicing, this strumming pattern, this technique that unlocks it, I'm set. And then we can allow our unique voice to carry that song because we're keeping things in line. That to me, uh, songwriting guitarists need to keep really close to themselves and not fall down that trap of an unrealistic version, un, uh, more an unhealthy version of themselves and trying to compare themselves to others. That's huge. Mm, yeah, it, it's, it's a hard line to walk, though, especially if you're working on sync placement stuff, like you mentioned okay. earlier, because you are trying to follow these briefs, right? So you're trying to <laughs> be like, okay, I need to write a song like Jason Mraz, but I don't try to sound exactly like Jason Mraz, you know, so it's, it's, it's kind of a hard line to walk. And I'm sure it just takes practice to be like, how can I not sound like a total copycat, but still in the style of? It is. It's like understanding the elements of you know what makes it's almost like i like to think of it this way a baker that's baking a cake understands the ingredients that need to go in to make a chocolate cake a vanilla cake whatever style but the twist and the design and the things they do no one does it exactly like that baker there are still elements that'll make that cake delicious that are just you know everyone does but the design, the elements, all those things are going to be a little bit different than the baker a couple doors down. Right. So it's I just... add buttermilk, which makes it moister than other people, <laughs> right? <laughs> it, and that's the thing. It's like these elements are not meant to restrain an artist or limit them. It's meant to give them a better guide to aim and get that song to fall into that genre, into that style but their unique takes can still come through because I always geek out when I can find the elements that have, that I know will hit the song perfectly, but then I get a chance to play around with different sounds and find the things that are maybe like an interesting combination. Like I love to layer my guitars when it comes to recording and finding different sounds. And maybe I, you know, map, you know, I throw my chain and I throw in like a really reverb pedal and a really fuzzy guitar and I really pitch shift it up to make it sound like a chipmunk but then I blend it behind another guitar that's pretty normal and straight down the middle, but that nobody's going to hear that chipmunk sound all the way, but it just adds this layer that makes that part a little bit more unique and a combination that not everybody does. Yep. That's the buttermilk. Totally. <laughs> I love it. Or the applesauce or whatever it is you add to your cake to make it more moist. I love that idea of like, sometimes it's, it's like something in the background, but like, you're not sure what it is, but it sounds a little bit different. Exactly. So, yeah. Really, really smart. I've been watching the great British baking show. I always oh, rewatch yeah. episodes. So I'm always loving to see what people do that their unique thing. They always bring that one ingredient that, that they were like, this is the secret thing. And Paul just kind of goes mm, soggy bottom. And it's always checked to see if there's a soggy bottom so that was my cake <laughs> that was yeah, i always watch the um the holiday baking and I, I love there's always somebody that's like well i'm from kentucky i have to put bourbon in everything you know that's her thing <laughs> so yeah we have those things that oh. are us and then we need to pair those with like not always doing that right and but uh -huh. making it be like a good mix between what we bring and then what we can bring in from you know other people and other influences and 
and all that. Well, you know that I always have to ask about income streams because that's kind of one of my things, you know, profitable musician and all that. So um, I, I know you, you kind of said to me like, well, I, you know, I make a very comfortable living from the guitar. Yeah. And what I love that is because it's like, it all stems from the guitar. And like, these are all these ways that I've made an income because of that. So I'd love to hear kind of generally like how, obviously you're not working at the car wash anymore. So <laughs> how are you, how are you able to have a comfortable income by being a songwriter, a teacher, you know, a guitarist, all those things? The the big thing, I, I don't think people realize that they can make a good living from the guitar because there's the stereotype of like, ah, broken musician is just like carrying his case, maybe getting a few pennies, maybe he'll get a real job. That's my vaudevillian voice because I feel that's always like the answer to everything. But to me, there was a whole new host of things opened up when I started to take my guitar more seriously and delved into uh, avoiding some of these pitfalls and really just honing in my own skills. The first thing was there are so many people that are looking for great session guitarists and the internet has just opened this mm -hmm. world, you know, avenues like sound better air gigs, where it's just like you can, if you are a solid guitarist that can track to a metronome, understands different styles, can arrange guitars, people will pay good money for a great guitarist. And, you know, I've, you know, I, maybe when I first started, I, I was geeked out when somebody paid me $75 <laughs> to be like, can you track, you know, one guitar? And I was like, how many takes? Just one good take of a rhythm. And I was like, yeah. And so I did. And I was like, that was the easiest $75 I ever made. And then I got, you know, the most extreme that I got for it was something that was a deadline where they contact me. They were like, I need this within an hour. Oh. And I got like, and I was like, well, here is my need this in an hour rate. Fine. I was just blown away for getting $400 for something that took me maybe 30 minutes to less than map out. And then they were like, here you go. And I was like, all this time I was carrying this mentality of like, there was only one way to make money in music. And that was through a band. And suddenly here was one way tracking for others. And then I got into the main thing, licensing, which I was like so curious about. Uh, building instrumentals was a really big thing because if you can understand the makeup of different genres and guitars place within those genres, you can start cranking out instrumentals. And that's what I do. I do that for fun. Just in the morning, I wake up, I have my first cup of coffee, I sit down and, you know, for maybe a week, every day i create a different instrumental that's in this genre and i do maybe like 10 or 15 and suddenly i've got this catalog and then i ship it off to a music library it goes in there and then it starts finding its way within shows because they're looking for things that sound like things but they don't want to pay those artists they want to find that thing that's right close to it and then the next thing was writing with artists writing with artists that were already signed to great sync libraries and sync agencies that are pushing their songs and I know as a writer, I will get the mark of what they're looking for as an artist, as a writer, what they need to sound like and what they are. I don't, you know, try to give them an identity that's not theirs. I know what fits for them. I can write it. I can help them produce it and I can guide it all with my guitar ends up producing a great song. That great song goes into an agency that is really hustling and making sure that artist gets noticed. And I get noticed because they're like, well, who wrote this? Who produced this? Who was, and then suddenly I get asked to do a few more things. That to me, there's so many, so many possible, you know, streams of income for, for writers and their guitar that they can start doing right away. Oh, thank you for outlining all that. That is super encouraging for all the artists watching and listening here that there's not just one way. And I love that you mentioned air gigs and I didn't know mm -hmm. about sound bed. That's a great, that's a great one I hadn't heard of. Um, but yeah, I love those opportunities. I've been doing those for years and it's just so simple, right? You're sitting at home at, in your home studio and doing it super quick and you get paid. You don't even have to go anywhere. And that's great for nowadays, especially, right? So I love that you mentioned all of those ways that people can make income 
from just really focusing on becoming a better guitarist, becoming Cute. a better songwriter and marrying the two. Yeah, it's it's just one of those things where it's, you know, even in a COVID world, last year I had my best year ever, ever, which blew my mind. And I say that because I know people struggled and I don't say that to brag, to say that is there are so many avenues out there that can support you, not just a little bit, but very, very well. Yeah, I think a lot of people that really had already started to delve into those multiple income streams actually did have their best year ever in 2020, yeah. which I know is hard. Like some of us, we feel guilty about that because we know that other musicians are struggling. But what we hope is that people will listen to us and, and, and see how we did that. And I will, you know, realize that they can do it too. They just need to go beyond, like you said, just touring, thinking that all of your income is from uh, touring and merch. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. It's not possible right now. And for those that had already opened up some of those income streams, they just really like turned up the volume on those income streams during this time, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, thank you. This has all been so good. Let our listeners and those who are watching know how they can connect with you online and on social media. Yeah. If they want to go to songrangforguitar.com, they can download. Uh, I have a whole bunch of free resources. Big one is my quick start guide because I talked about voicings. There are four voicings that I'll give you right away that you can understand the genres that they're used and how to start to apply it. And they can follow me on Instagram at songrangforguitar. Super easy. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's always so fun to talk to you. And for anyone that's watching or listening, uh, if you want to hear more about kind of that starving artist mentality and dealing with, you know, overcoming that and looking at more income streams. I know that Mike and I talked about that on his podcast as well. Do you want to let them know how to find your podcast? Yeah. If they just go to songrangforguitar.com and then click the link podcast, they will see your episode up there. And that was a wonderful episode because I love what you do to them power musicians to not just think one way, but to understand the possibilities of different revenue streams they can start applying now, because that to me is huge. Mm, thank you. And I love that everywhere we look, you are songwriting for guitar. <laughs> like, I hope every artist takes that to, to mind, you know, when you're doing your branding, like it's so easy to find him. If you, as long as you know that his is his brand name, you can find him anywhere. So your podcast, your, you know, course, your, you know, all of it, super smart. So thank you for, for emulating that because it's, I think it's really a, a good lesson in branding for all of us. No, thank you, Brie. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.